different versions of the Bible would you say exist today? 20? 40? 60? Believe it or not, there are over 400 Bibles in the English language alone. You may be wondering, why are there so many? Which one is the real one? How would I be able to tell? The purpose of this documentary is to answer those questions. But before we do though, we need to answer another question. And that is, how can we be sure that a perfect Bible does exist? Couldn't the words have been lost in translation hundreds of years ago? How can we begin to search for something that we aren't sure is real? The Bible says in Psalm 12 verses 6 and 7, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. According to this verse, God has promised to preserve his words so that every generation has access to them. So if his words don't exist today, God has broken that promise. In Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. There we have a promise from Jesus Christ himself that his words will not pass away. Therefore, they must exist somewhere. The question is, which Bible contains them? Now it's time to answer that question. In order to do so, we'll need to start from the very beginning, when the Bible first began to be written. The Bible is broken into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament tells us about the time period before Jesus was born. And the New Testament tells us about the time period after Jesus was born. The Old Testament was written over the course of 1,000 years by men called prophets, men such as Moses, Nehemiah, and Daniel. It's important to note that these prophets were not writing down whatever came into their head. The Bible says in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So according to that verse, the prophets were writing down the exact words that the Holy Ghost told them to write. The books these prophets wrote are known collectively as the Old Testament. The Old Testament was possessed by a single nation, originally known as Israel. All the other countries worshipped their own gods and had their own religions. The nation of Israel spoke Hebrew, and so the prophets wrote the Old Testament books in Hebrew. The New Testament was written approximately 400 years after the completion of the Old Testament. The New Testament was also written by prophets, but now their writings were no longer intended for a single nation. They were intended for Christians throughout the whole world. When the New Testament was written, the Roman Empire ruled the majority of the world. The language of the Roman Empire was Greek, so consequently, most of the world spoke Greek. Hence, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. A good example is the book of 1 Corinthians, a letter written to a church in Corinth, a city in a region of Greece known as Achaia. These letters were then copied by hand and dispersed among Christians throughout the world. These handwritten copies are now known as manuscripts. You may be wondering, how did those manuscripts remain unaltered over the course of centuries? Because there were so many copies made, numbering in the thousands, and the manuscripts had such a high degree of consistency, over 95%, it was easy for readers to spot an error. If a word in a certain manuscript did not agree with the majority, the outlier was simply rejected and the majority was accepted. For example, let's say 5,000 manuscripts said that Jonah was swallowed up by a whale, and three manuscripts said that Jonah was swallowed up by a shark. It was easy for them to tell that the 5,000 manuscripts were correct, and that the five outliers were incorrect. But now let's get down to the real question. How did the Old Testament, written in Hebrew, and the New Testament, written in Greek, become the Bible, written in English? Various forms of English, such as Old English and Middle English, were spoken as early as the 5th century. 
The formation of modern English, the English that we speak today, began in the late 14th century and was completed by 1550. During the centuries when the English language was developing, an era known as the Dark Ages, the Catholic Church held a large amount of power in Europe, even over kings and queens of entire countries. The Catholic Church was so powerful that whenever a king or queen was crowned, it was the Pope who placed the crown on his or her head, symbolizing the Pope's approval of this appointment to power. During the Dark Ages, few people knew how to read Greek, and even fewer people knew how to read Hebrew. This ability was generally confined to the wealthy and well-educated. The common people, for the most part, spoke Latin. Consequently, the Catholic Church created their own Latin version of the Bible, known as the Latin Vulgate. The Catholic Church then used the Latin Vulgate to convince people that they needed to pay money in order to be forgiven for their sins. This was a practice known as selling indulgences. A man named Erasmus, who was able to read the original Greek manuscripts, saw what the Catholic Church was doing, and in 1516 he compiled several of the original Greek manuscripts and published an accurate Greek New Testament, known as the Textus Receptus. Erasmus then took the Greek and placed it side by side with the Catholic Church's Latin. This allowed the common people to see how they had been deceived. As a result, money stopped flowing to Rome, and Michelangelo was eventually forced to stop painting the Sistine Chapel for a time due to lack of funding. Since English was becoming the most common language in England, the people of England desired a Bible written in English. The Catholic Church, however, had placed the death penalty on anyone trying to translate the scripture into English. In spite of this prohibition, in 1522, a man named William Tyndale attempted to translate the Greek New Testament into modern English. Soon after, however, he was arrested for his efforts and burned at the stake. His last words before he died were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Three years later, in 1539, the King of England, named King Henry VIII, legalized the translation of Scripture into English. After King Henry VIII's death, several kings and queens came into power in England. Some helped forward the cause of translating the Scripture into English, and some fought against it. You may have heard of Queen Mary I, also known as Bloody Mary, who reenacted the laws against translating scripture into English. She's the one who burned 300 Christians at the stake. During this time, various attempts at translating the Hebrew and Greek into English were made. These attempts included the Great Bible, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, and the Matthews Bible. These translations, while not poor, had errors and inconsistencies and left the people of England desirous of a translation they could fully trust. In 1604, King James I, moved by popular opinion, authorized a new translation to underway. This translation was intended to be the final attempt at translating the Hebrew and Greek into English. Fifty-four of the greatest scholars at that time were gathered together to work on the project. Each of these scholars was fluent in many different languages, including Hebrew and Greek. These scholars were then broken up into six groups and assigned a certain portion of scripture to translate. They were given two rules. The Old Testament had to be translated directly from the original Hebrew, and the New Testament had to be translated directly from the original Greek. The leaders of these six groups then came together and arrived at the final conclusion for each word to be written in the King James Bible. Their work was completed in 1610 and published in 1611. It was sold in a handheld version that same year, and it was the Bible used by the vast majority of Christians for the next three centuries. Today, however, there are many different versions of the Bible in English. Where did these versions come from? These versions were not written until nearly three centuries after the King James Bible was written, when two new manuscripts were discovered, manuscripts that do not agree with the 5,000 manuscripts that had been read since the first century. 
One of these manuscripts, known as Codex Sinaiticus, or Codex A, was discovered in a Catholic monastery named St. Catherine's Monastery by a man named Constantine von Tischendorf, a German evolutionist theologian. Tischendorf describes his discovery as such. I perceived a large and wide basket full of old parchments, and the librarian told me that two heaps like this had been already committed to the flames. What was my surprise to find amid these heaps of papers? The second manuscript, known as Codex Vaticanus, or Codex B, was found in 1481 in a trash bin in the Vatican Library. The Westminster Dictionary of the Bible has this to say about Codex Vaticanus. It should be noted that there is no prominent biblical manuscripts in which there occur such gross cases of misspelling, faulty grammar, and omission as in Codex B. John Bergen, a biblical scholar from the 19th century, when writing about Codex Vaticanus, said, The impurity of the text exhibited by these codices is not a question of opinion, but fact. In the Gospels alone, Codex B leaves out words or whole clauses no less than 1,491 times. It bears traces of careless transcriptions on every page. In the late 19th century, Two professors at Cambridge University, Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, used these two manuscripts to write their own Greek New Testament, which they later published in 1881. Westcott and Hort were not Christians. Neither did they claim to be Christians. They were Darwinian theologians at Oxford and Cambridge University. They did not believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They did not believe that he died for our sins. They did not believe that hell was a place of punishment, and they did not believe that the scriptures were God's word. Here are some direct quotes from these men. I reject the infallibility of holy scriptures overwhelmingly. Our Bible, as well as our faith, is a mere compromise. Hell is not the place of punishment of the guilty. It is the common abode of departed spirits. The popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Nothing can be more unscriptural than the limiting of Christ bearing our sins and sufferings to his death. But indeed, that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common. These men also founded two occult societies at Cambridge University, the Ghostly Guild and the Hermes Club. They were also active members at a third New Age society called the Society for Psychical Research, which was dedicated to investigating paranormal phenomenon. Years later, after having published their Greek New Testament, these men ended up admitting that their trifling alterations with the Greek New Testament had begun a new period in church history, and they were right. Their Greek New Testament is the text behind every modern version we have today. So which New Testament does the Greek support? The Textus Receptus of the King James Bible, or Westcott and Hort's New Testament of the modern versions? In total, 5,262 Greek manuscripts exist today. Of these, 45 support Westcott and Hort's Greek New Testament, and 5,217 support the Textus Receptus. This means that less than 1% support Westcott and Hort, and over 99% support the Textus Receptus. So we are left with a decision. Is the King James Bible translated from the Textus Receptus which is based off the vast majority of Greek manuscripts, the Word of God? Or are these new versions translated from Westcott and Hort's Greek New Testament, which is based off two outlier manuscripts, the Word of God? Because the manuscripts these Bibles are based off of were discovered in a Catholic monastery in a Catholic library, we should expect them to contain Catholic doctrines. Let's investigate whether that's true. The Catholic Church holds the practice of baptizing babies. The King James Bible, however, teaches that a person must be saved first and then can be baptized. 
The scriptural proof for this is found in Acts chapter 8. In this chapter, an Ethiopian eunuch has just been saved by a man named Philip. After being saved, the Ethiopian eunuch wants to be baptized. The King James Bible says in Acts 8.36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37 says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 37 is telling us what the prerequisite for baptism is. First, you must be saved by believing in Jesus, and then it is okay to be baptized. Verse 38 says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Today, in 2019, the New International Version, known as the NIV, is the most widely read version in the English language. In this modern translation, Acts 37 is missing. The text skips straight to verse 38, making it appear to the reader as if there is no prerequisite for baptism. Anyone can get baptized at any time. Not only is this verse missing in the NIV, it is also missing in nearly every modern Bible we see today. The Catholic Church has long taught the doctrine of self-flagellation. This is the practice of beating one's own body in order to show remorse for one's sins. While this practice is not as popular as it once was, it can still be found today in countries such as the Philippines, where devout Catholics whip themselves and in some extreme instances even crucify themselves. The King James Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9.27, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. What Paul is talking about here is disciplining his body so that he doesn't commit the sins his flesh wants to commit. In the NIV, this verse is changed to, No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize. The American Standard Version changes this verse to, But I buffet my body and bring it into bondage, lest by any means, after I have preached to others, I myself should be rejected. The World English Bible says, But I beat my body and bring it into submission, lest by any means, after I have preached to others, I myself should be rejected. After reading this verse in the modern versions, a reader could come to the conclusion that beating one's own body is a legitimate practice supported by the Bible. The doctrine of the Trinity is the doctrine that God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all separate persons, yet comprise one God. One verse in the King James Bible that supports this doctrine is 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This verse proves that though the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are separate, they all comprise one God. The NIV and ESV change this verse to, for there are three that testify. The New Living Translation changes it to, so we have these three witnesses. Notice in these versions, there is no mention of any of the members of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Ghost, making it impossible to derive the doctrine of the Trinity. The King James Bible teaches the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. Salvation was paid for us by Jesus Christ when he died for us on the cross. We receive it by believing on him. 1 Corinthians 1.18 in the King James Bible says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Notice it says are saved, as in their salvation has already been completed. The ESV, however, turns salvation into a process, something attained over time. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 
From this, the reader can come to the conclusion that salvation is something you work towards over time. The ESV makes this same change to another verse. 2 Corinthians 2.15 in the King James Bible says, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. The ESV changes this verse to, For we are the aroma of Christ to God, among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. The doctrine of the deity of Christ is the doctrine that Jesus Christ, while he came to earth, was fully man and fully God. One verse that proves the deity of Christ in the King James Bible is 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. According to that verse, God was manifest in the flesh. Now, who was manifest in the flesh? We know that Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh. This proves that Jesus Christ is God. In the NIV, this verse says, He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. Notice the word God is changed to He, making it impossible to prove that Jesus Christ is God. This same change is made in the English Standard Version. The word God is changed to He. Another way these modern versions attack the deity of Christ is by making it appear as if Jesus has a starting point. The King James Bible says that Jesus has always existed throughout eternity. One of the verses that talks about Jesus' eternal existence is Micah 5.2. This verse says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Notice Jesus' goings forth have been from everlasting. This verse in the ESV reads, But you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Notice how the words from everlasting are changed to from ancient days. This makes it appear as if Jesus has not existed throughout eternity. The NIV makes this same change, saying that Jesus' origins are from ancient times. The NLT says that Jesus has his origins in the distant past, the King James Bible is the only Bible that gets it right. In the Old Testament story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three men are told by King Nebuchadnezzar to worship the statue that he made for himself. And if they do not, they will be thrown into a furnace of fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's statue, and consequently they are thrown into a furnace of fire. Once they are thrown in, the fire does not hurt them. The Bible describes King Nebuchadnezzar's reaction in Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo! I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Notice, Jesus was present in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, protecting them from harm. What do all the modern translations do? They change the words, Son of God, to a Son of the Gods. Notice, it is no longer capitalized and God's is made plural, making Jesus no longer the Son of God. In these versions, he is the Son of the Gods. The fourth and final example of how the modern versions attack the deity of Christ is found in Philippians 2.6. In the King James Bible, it says, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. According to this verse, Jesus Christ knew that he was equal with God. 
This is because he was just as divine as God the Father. This same verse in the ESV says the exact opposite. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, in this version, Jesus is unable to grasp equality with God. The King James Bible teaches the doctrine of the virgin birth. This is the doctrine that Jesus did not have an earthly father. His mother Mary was a virgin when she conceived a child through the Holy Ghost, making God his father. The King James Bible says in Luke 2.33, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Notice, the King James Bible takes effort not to call Joseph Jesus' father. This is because God is his father. The NIV, however, says, The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. If Joseph is Jesus' father, that would mean that he is not the Son of God. And if he is not the Son of God, then the whole gospel falls on its face. This same change is made in the English Standard Version. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. In the King James Bible, in the book of Galatians, Paul is writing about people spreading heresy in the churches. He writes in Galatians 5.12, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. In the King James Bible, the phrase cut off often refers to the expelling of a disobedient person from a group. In the NIV, this verse says, As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. The English Standard Version says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. The Common English Bible says, I wish that the ones who are upsetting you would castrate themselves. The contemporary English version says, I wish that everyone who is upsetting you would not only get circumcised, but would cut off much more. In the Old Testament, Saul was the name of the first king to ever reign over the nation of Israel. The King James Bible says in 1 Samuel 13, 1, Saul reigned for one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. The English Standard Version changes this to, Saul lived for one year, and then became king, and when he had reigned for two years over Israel. This would mean that Saul was one years old when he became king. There's only one problem with that. When the Bible talks about Saul becoming king, it says that he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. 1 Samuel 10.23 says in the King James, And they ran and fetched him thence, and when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. One of the most famous stories in the Bible is the story of David and Goliath. David, a young shepherd boy, fights against the giant soldier of the Philistines. David miraculously wins the battle with a sling and a stone. The ESV, however, says someone else killed Goliath. The ESV says in 2 Samuel 21.19, and there was again war with the Philistines at Gob, and Elhanan, the son of Jair Origim, the Bethlehemite, struck down Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. The word Lucifer is the name the Bible gives to Satan. This word is only found one time in the King James Bible. That's Isaiah 14.12. The King James reads, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? This verse is describing Satan being thrown out of heaven. The NIV changes this verse to, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. At first glance, this change may seem insignificant. But once compared with other scripture, its gravity becomes far more apparent. Revelation 22.16 in the King James Bible says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. The Bible is giving the title morning star to Jesus. So in the NIV, 
Jesus gets thrown out of heaven, not Satan. Not only do these modern versions twist verses, they also remove verses entirely. Verses such as Matthew 17, 21. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Matthew 18, 11, For the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. Matthew 23, 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Mark seven sixteen, If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Mark eleven twenty six, But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you. In total, 16 verses are missing from all modern translations. Other times, even if the entire verse is not removed, large phrases within the verse are removed, taking away important information from the reader. For example, Matthew 5.44 in the King James Bible says, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. The NIV and the NASB both say, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The part about blessing them that curse you and doing good to them that hate you is gone. Matthew 27.35 in the King James says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. The NIV says, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The part about the prophecy being fulfilled is gone. The King James Bible in Revelation 1.11 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Notice the King James Bible gives the titles Alpha and Omega and First and the Last to Jesus. The ESV says, saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Notice the titles for Jesus, Alpha and Omega, and the First and the Last are gone. Omissions such as these even affect the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6.13 in the King James says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All modern versions leave out the last 14 words about God possessing the kingdom and the power and the glory. Other times, footnotes are added underneath the verse that say, The oldest manuscripts do not contain this verse. By this, they are referring to Codex A and Codex B. This type of footnote is placed besides verses such as Mark 16:15, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. In Luke 23:34, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. This type of footnote can plant doubt in the reader's minds as to whether or not these verses should be included in the Bible. The Bible tells us that the number of the Antichrist is 666. Revelation 13.18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. All modern translations, such as the NIV, ESV, NLT, and NASB, include a footnote at the end of the last chapter of the book of Mark. This footnote says, the two oldest Greek manuscripts and some other authorities omit verse 9 to the end. This means the two manuscripts they use to write their Bibles don't contain the last 12 verses of the book of Mark. Why is this significant? Because the book of Mark contains 678 verses. If you subtract 12 verses, you're left with 666 verses. Even the New King James, which many think to be harmless because it claims to be a relative of the King James Bible, has countless alterations and omissions. The New King James Bible omits the word Lord 66 times, 
omits the word God 51 times, omits the word heaven 50 times, omits the word repent 44 times, omits the word blood 23 times, and omits the word hell 22 times. The New King James Version also entirely omits the word Jehovah, New Testament, damnation, and devils. In addition, the New King James removes the these and the thous and the yees. While these words may seem archaic, they actually play an important role in the King James Bible. Because the these and the thous are singular, and the yees are plural, they tell the reader whether the speaker is addressing a single person or a larger audience. So far, we have tracked a constant thread of God's word throughout history. The Old Testament existed in Hebrew, and the New Testament existed in Greek. Then, in 1611, both the Hebrew and Greek were translated into English. Notice that throughout this timeline, the scripture always existed in one language. There wasn't an Egyptian Old Testament, and a Chinese Old Testament, and a German Old Testament. There was simply a Hebrew Old Testament. The same is true for the New Testament. The Textus Receptus is not based off of manuscripts in dozens of different languages. It is based off 5,000 manuscripts solely in Greek. The reason this is important is because many people think that the Bible exists in all different languages. However, this has never been the case at any point throughout history. It has always existed in only one language, and it still exists in only one language today, and that's English. God chose English for a reason. English is the only language spoken in nearly every country in the world. By translating his Bible into English, he gave the largest percentage of people in the world access to his words. Even the Spanish Bible, the Reign of Valera, which claims to be based off the Texas Receptus, is notorious among bilinguals for coming short of the King James Bible and is in constant need of revision even today. Over 400 different versions of the Bible exist in the English language. The question is, why? There aren't nearly that many versions of any other book in the world. What's the reason for all this confusion? The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. The corporations that own these modern versions are trying to make money. Every time one of their Bibles is purchased, they make a profit. Zondervan, the company that owns the rights to the New International Version, has released an updated version of their Bible three times, once in 1978, once in 1984, and once in 2011. Why? Because each time a new version of the NIV is released, everyone who owns an old version has to go buy an updated copy. The King James Bible is the only Bible not under copyright laws. It can be purchased for a single dollar at any dollar store today. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. So even in Paul's day, many people were trying to corrupt God's word. But this wasn't something new to the first century. This had been Satan's strategy from the very beginning of mankind. Genesis 3 verses 1 through 5 say, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Notice what Satan is attempting to do here. Satan is attempting to tamper with God's word. God had told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of good and evil. And Satan is questioning what God said. Satan succeeds in planting doubt in Eve's mind about the accuracy of God's word. And because of that, she ends up committing the first sin of mankind. The same is true today. Because Christians are left with so much doubt concerning what God's word actually is, 
it makes keeping his commandments impossible. The Bible tells us that the true word of God will never be corrupted. In fact, it says it can't be corrupted. 1 Peter 1 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The King James Bible is that incorruptible seed. It has remained unchanged for over 400 years, translated directly from the original Hebrew and Greek. It is the true word of God today. Hey guys, my name is Tyler Doka. I'm the pastor of Great Harvest Church. If you guys are convinced that the King James Bible is the Word of God, the next step you need to take is to find a King James Bible church. If you're anywhere close to New York, we would love to have you. Our church is located in Woodmere, New York, which is on Long Island. If not, find a King James Bible church in your area, and you can contact us anytime. Our email will be right here at the bottom. And we just hope that you guys learn from this video, that you truly understand it and believe it, and that you have confessed it with your mouth. We thank you for watching, and God bless.